Hello, I'm Bob Kavinsky and I'm the president of the Prairie Star Club here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'd like to welcome you to How to Buy a Telescope. Uh, over the last several years, our end of November meetings, we typically open up to the public and bring in uh, telescopes and show this presentation along with some examples of different telescopes to help people if they're interested in looking at buying a telescope here for the holidays. Unfortunately, this year, because of COVID, we're not able to do so. So we thought we'd try to share with you a, some examples and, and uh, pr give you at least a presentation here online. And then you'll be able to, uh, if you'd like to have some questions answered, uh, you can go on to www prairieastronomyclub.org to our website and uh, there you can post a question. Uh, it may take us a day or two before those questions get posted to our site so please give us a little bit of time. Once we get the uh, opportunity to view it we'll try to answer your questions for you. So let's talk about how to buy a telescope. First thing is you before buying a telescope you got to think about what you're going to use that telescope for. Um, are you going to observe with a child or young person. Uh, does it need to be fairly simple and very, you know, uh, uh, so in case their hands get on it, is it uh, very sensitive, uh, steriable, that type of thing. Is it going to be something you're going to use in your backyard or on your deck? Kind of easy stuff. Or you do want to get into, into the astronomy as a hobby and get a little bit detailed. Uh, do you want to get into uh, more deeper observing? Do you want to get into photography? All those questions you probably need to ask first before you start to decide what type of telescope there are three basic types of telescopes that are available in the marketplace. The first one is called a refractor, example in the upper left hand on the side of the screen. Um, refractor is kind of like the old pirate ship uh, 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 telescope. Light comes in one air and it's refracted through a mirror system to the, uh, to the uh, base of the telescope where the eyepiece is. And um, very simple, very tight. These are excellent high quality telescopes tend to be a little bit more expensive as you get into larger sizes um, because of the way they're built and the, the very special mirrors that are in them. The second type of telescope is called a reflector, reflector or Newtonian type telescope. It has a large mirror at the base of the telescope so the light comes in one end, goes all the way to the base, comes back up, reflects on a small mirror out into the eyepiece, so thus reflecting the light off of a mirror. Uh, what it does, it offers you the opportunity to have twice that length of the overall eyepiece. And it gives you an opportunity to have a relatively simple eyepiece. These are typically a little larger uh, sizings and uh, gives you a very excellent view. The third type of telescope is called a Cassegrain or Schmidt Cassegrain, or sometimes Mossetoff is another name for these. Uh, the light comes in one end, goes down to a base mirror, comes back up to the second mirror, and then back out to to the bottom end again. Uh, what it does, it takes that refractor uh, eyepiece and what it does, or a telescope, and it bends it, it folds it a couple times, and basically makes it a much shorter, much more compact, easier to handle, easier to store, easier to travel with. Um, that's the three basic types of telescopes that are in the marketplace. Uh, the same telescopes are different mounts and they vary based on price. The azimuth mount on the bottom left picture uh, swivels, it's got an arm. Sometimes it can be motorized, sometimes not, depending on the size of the telescope, the amount of money. The second mount is a, a basic box mount called a Dobsonian. This was developed by a gentleman in the early 1900s called uh, Dobson, and uh, it was very simple. It was, uh, Left, it goes swivel, so it goes left, right, up, and down. Because of that, it's very low cost. Thus, you get a lot of scope telescope for the money with the Dobsonian. And the third one is an equatorial. This is the one you sometimes see with the tripod. It's got weights. Um, and sometimes they're set up with motors and, and drive units. They typically uh, uh, are a little bit, uh, a little bit more expensive telescopes. They're also a little bit more of a challenge to start with, but they can give you a very excellent view. A lot of times the equatorial mounts are used uh, for photography. So, because uh, you can put a motor on them and drive them and they'll be able to stay with an object and, and uh, be able to take photography. So the mounts, of course, impact price. The uh, basic box mount, I meant, box mount, like I mentioned in the Dobsonian, very inexpensive. It's a couple of pieces of plywood. The azimuth mount is slightly more expensive, a little bit more specific. It's used for a lot of the smaller end telescopes, though. It does an excellent job. And then several different types of tripods. Um, the fork mount that you see here in the middle with the, uh, what's called a schmidt cassegrain in the center, uh, that's a little higher end. It's got a motor. Typically, the fork mounts tend to be ones that are set up with motors and drives and, and um, a little bit more computerized. So just different uh, types of mounts that you're looking at. So what can I get from my 
that's that's the question that we always get. Um, there's a lot of different ways that, or who to buy from, so yeah, that depends a little bit. So Orion uh, uh, Orion Telescopes uh, dot com or Astronomics Oceanside out of California has many different brands of telescopes. Telescopes dot com, High Points Scientific. Uh, there are several different uh, uh, sources. Unfortunately, most of them are online. Uh, we are fairly limited on retail locations here in Nebraska that have uh, uh, decent telescopes from the standpoint of, of uh, aperture and size and the brands that we typically recommend. The most common brands are Orion, Celestron, Mead, Skywatcher, or uh, Scientific Explorer, Explorer Scientific, or Zumo. Those are probably the five brands that are most common ones that we typically recommend. Uh, there are other brands that are out there, but we typically stay with these five because they have uh, his, his, historically had very high quality, high, um, high end performance and uh, for the cost. And uh, so we typically recommend to stay with one of these five brands. It doesn't mean you have to, just that's the recommendation. Uh, so what can I get for my money? So if you're spending that 50 to $150 range, you're fairly limited as far as telescopes. The center two here are some um, uh, basic two to three inch telescopes that you can buy for that uh, price range. Unfortunately, the tripods on these will tend to be fairly lightweight. So uh, they're not gonna be ones that you're gonna be able to handle and around a lot. Uh, you have to be a little careful when you're setting them up and uh, they're gonna be more difficult to stay uh, tight. There is a, Celestron has their first scope out. It's a, about a two and a half inch. And it's a nice little scope for the money. It's got a, on a little azimuth uh, for like a tabletop or on top of a picnic table if you're camping. Uh, it's a nice little scope for the money. Honestly, for that price range though, the best telescope is quite frankly a good pair of binoculars. Uh, for 50 to $130 range, you can get from a five by, um, uh, excuse me, a 10 by 50 all the way up to a 20 by 80 pair of uh, good, good um, pair of uh, binoculars. One advantage of the binoculars, uh, you can look at for uh, astronomy during the evening and the, uh, nighttime, but during the day you can enjoy it for uh, views of the, of the uh, landscapes and also for uh, wildlife, etc. So it has a much more dual, dual purpose um, and for that price range typically is a good spend for the money for observing. In that two to three hundred dollar range we can start to get into the smaller type telescopes four and a half to six inch. The Orion Sky Star Blaster on the far right is an azimuth mount. I actually purchased one of these telescopes for, uh, for a, uh, a school in, in Africa and it's an excellent telescope for the money. Um, four and a half to six inch telescopes uh, in that 250 300 dollar range uh, there are several different brand names. I have a couple of Orions in here, but you can go with Zumo, Mead. All of them uh, will typically have a telescope in this range, in this sizing, and uh, about this type. Dobsonians are going to be a little bit better priced just because you're paying for a very low end uh, mount. Because of that, you get a lot of telescopes from them. Uh, when you get to three to six hundred dollar range, you should be able to move up into about an eight inch telescope, which is a, an excellent amateur telescope. Um, I had this uh, this uh, Skycrex XT8 Orion telescope was my first scope for 17, 18 years. I used that with my both my daughter and my son viewing. It's an excellent telescope for um, typically about an eight inch when you're looking at a. a simple Dobsonian reflector, a reflector. If you want a, a little bit higher end, computerized, uh, very entry level Celestron Nexstar 4 ac uh, is computerized. It's a very simple uh, uh, push to or go to telescope um, for about $500. It's only a four inch size, so it's a little bit small, but you can get start to get into the computerization at this price range. So typically you're gonna get into the six, $700 range for a little bit larger telescopes that's gonna have the computerization or the ability to say, go find this and it does. Uh, they're a little bit more complex. With a telescope, what am I gonna see with these basic small telescopes? And you know, the craters of the moon and mountains, you can see with a good pair of binoculars and small telescopes just enhance that. The rings of Saturn are excellent in 
see those very easily. Uh, Jupiter and its four largest moons can be seen with a good pair of binoculars, but uh, the belts, the thermal belts across, and you can pick up two to four of those typically with a smaller telescope very easily in a dark sky, uh, it's, it's going to show beauty. In Mars, you'll start to see some of the Mari, the darker uh, shaded areas within the planet. Uh, that's kind of nice. Double stars start to pick up because you can start to separate their, their spaces between them. One nice thing with the double stars is that many of them are different colors and with our eyes at night, we are we go to gray vision or dark vision, uh, so we see black and white. But with um, double stars, you can pick up color, and that's kind of a, the contrast. Your eyes will start to pick up some color. Open star clusters, globular clusters, these are just clusters of stars in, uh, in our Milky Way or near to us. Some nebulas in other galaxies, like the Andromeda Galaxy, is a naked eye object. Um, but uh, you see a little fun spot in the good pair of binoculars, you can see a little bit of texture to it. In a small telescope, it'll fill the eyepiece. So just depends on what you're looking for, but you'll be able to see a lot of objects. Um, in fact, hundreds of objects will be picked up in a four to five inch telescope without any, without any problems at all. So what can I see? What kind of things will I see? Well, this is the Orion Nebula, and we're looking at a visual symptom, uh, visual um, view of it. Uh, that's what you'll see through a like about an eight, six to eight inch telescope. The astrophoto on, a, on the right side is that same image, that, but it's uh, stacking multiple layers of time-lapse photography. And it's also a lot of false image. With astrophotography, they take different wavelengths and they add colors to it. Uh, we don't typically see this kind of color through a telescope. Most of the time we're seeing black and white, you see some uh, some oranges, some reds, some blues, some yellows and greens, but for the most part, uh, you're going to see black and white, a grayscale of most of the major objects in the sky. So uh, we always recommend that when you're buying a telescope, we really want you to consider buying as much aperture as you can. The larger the larger your eyeball is to the sky, the more you can see with it. In fact, the more, the larger your eye, the bigger the scope, the more photons of light that you can bring in and the more you can do with it. You can manipulate with filters and get better resolution and, and quality. An example of that is here looking at just a, a galaxy in the sky. Through a four inch telescope, you can see kind of a fuzzy spot with a brighter core. Sometimes you can see a little bit of the arm. That's pretty uh, amazing if you can see that with a four inch telescope. As you get into an eight inch telescope, you start to pick up some of the detail, you might pick up some of the arms, uh, some of the structure within it, within it. And then when you get into a 12 inch telescope, which is kind of just beyond where most amateurs uh, start with telescopes, you can start to pick up much more detail. You might see some little uh, star clusters within the within the arms and more detail and separation of the arms. Um, that's that's typically what you're going to see. So when we talk about power, that's always the question I get. What about how much power does this telescope have? And really, it's kind of interesting. For most of us, we're trying to work with as low a power as possible. And I'll explain that in a minute. So most telescopes you're going to buy, you're going to get a lot of times two eyepieces. You're going to get a high power eyepiece and a low power eyepiece. The low power eyepiece is going to be a 20, 25, 28, or 30 millimeter eyepiece. That would be the low power. The higher power will be something in the 10 to 15 millimeter range. Now what do we mean by that millimeter? What's, how does that relate to power? So what you do is you take the focal length of the of the telescope. The focal length is given on all telescopes but be basically the distance from the mirror to your eyeball. So let's say, as an example, you've got a 1200 millimeter uh, telescope, which would be a common um, telescope in the uh, six and eight inch range would be typically eight inch for sure. You're starting to get up to about 1200 uh, millimeter. So a 20 millimeter eyepiece would be 60 power. You divide 20 into one uh, 1200. If you were going to use that 10 millimeter eyepiece, for instance, it'd be 120 power be a little bit uh, higher power. So that's kind of how you look at it. Typically with a, te uh, uh, with a telescope, you get about 50 um, magnifications per inch of aperture. That's the maximum perfect conditions and we never see that. Usually it's about 50 to 65% of it. So for instance, if I have a four inch um, telescope, the theory says I can have up to about 200 magnification. You're not going to see anything with 200 magnification on that telescope, but between 50 and 60, um, or excuse me, between uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent, so about 100, 120, 
uh, you'll be very usable with the four inch um, telescope. So that's kind of how we look at it. So avoid small telescopes because of that claim that you can go to really high power. So in this image on the left is um, a picture of Saturn. This happens to be at about 50 power, about uh, average power for a telescope. Uh, you can see a lot of detail. You can see the rings very well, some separation. You can see the uh, shadow. Uh, it's a very nice, clear, small image, but very clear. On the second image in the middle, it starts to fuzz out. This is at 100 power. So I double that power, but I end up with a much uh, uh, poorer image. And of course, that double it again, and I just about can't tell that it's Saturn anymore. The reason for that, it's called an inverse square. So every time I double the power, I get one fourth the image. So it's uh, one, two squared. So that's one fourth. So if I go from 50 to 100, I get one fourth the amount of resolution and detail. If I double it again, I get one sixteenth the amount of information at the eyepiece. And that's the reason why you want it, uh, you want aperture, but you also want to be able to uh, moderate that power so that you don't uh, you don't overpower your telescope in the size that it has. So most telescopes are going to come with that size. The one thing I will caution you on though is stay away from any telescope that recommend or has on its IP size a 0.96 inch or 0.965 inch. Um, these are small telescopes. They're virtually impossible to find. They have, uh, you can't find these eyepieces anywhere. You should avoid them at all costs because you're going to be very disappointed. Most of today's telescopes are going to come with uh, a one and a quarter inch at minimum, or they'll come with a two inch. A two inch typically will then have an adapter that will allow you to use one and a quarter inch eyepieces. That's the absolute minimum eyepiece that you would want to have in a telescope. Okay, this is an example of one that's just a little bit outrageous claims and pointed out just because it's the type of telescope you really don't want to buy. Um, <clears throat> this one makes some claims two to 300, two to 200 plus power uh, with a little bitty telescope like this. Uh, it's only uh, a, 50, a 50 or 60. That's uh, basically just under a two inch or uh, maximum of a two inch size telescope. Uh, it gives it a picture on the side. You can see that the, the uh, tripod is an extremely flimsy one. You're not going to be able to stabilize it very well. The other thing that's kind of interesting is this 0.96 uh, plastic focuser. That's the size of the eyepiece, and it gives you a 20 and a, a 6 millimeter eyepiece. And plus, it gives you a 3x magnifier besides that you can use it to magnify those eyepieces. Um, a 20 millimeter and that size eyepiece, even if you were looking at the doubt you would see much for detail. It'd be a white smudge, uh, maybe some detail. Uh, you might be able to pick up some dark areas, light areas, but nothing really of any detail. Be careful not to purchase a, a telescope that makes these off ranges claims and also with the small uh, eyepieces. That eyepiece, you're going to be looking through a size of a, a, a piece of glass that's about the size of a head of a pin. It's not going to give you much detail or information at the eye. It's going to be very difficult to see. A okay. couple things that uh, look for when you're uh, using a telescope. First thing is, how do I find stuff in the sky? And there's a lot of different tools and electronics available. But one of the most common uh, maps that, quite frankly, almost all of us use, uh, even those of us that have been observing for 30 plus years, we still use this very basic map from uh, www.skymaps.com. The nice thing is it tells you everything that's up during the month um, and kind of the key key uh, constellations and even some of the objects that you should be able to find in a small telescope. On the left side, it tells you kind of the calendar of the month and might highlight some uh, features like uh, meteor showers and other things that might be of importance. The other nice thing with this map is on the back side, it shows you a list of uh, key objects during the month that are what's called naked eye or unaided uh, with, with uh, binoculars and to give you a, another list of about a dozen uh, or more uh, items or objects that are, are in binoculars or small telescopes and then another dozen or so that are, are larger uh, aperture telescopes. So it's really nice and it's convenient to work with. Um, if you want to get into a little bit more detail, um, other than that map that I just showed you, uh, a basic sky atlas is, uh, is always good. The most common one is this uh, pocket sky atlas from a Sky and Telescope. Uh, it's about a $15, $16, 6 by 9 inch uh, um, booklet. It also comes available at a $20 version, which is an 8 and a half by 11 size. Uh, for those of us that are a little bit more uh, optically challenged because of age, it, uh, it, <laughs> that nicer, larger print is, is nice, but you don't have to spend a lot of money. 
you can get uh, a really, really good quality book. The nice thing is these books are both have uh, waxed paper. So I've had my uh, pocket atlas for over 15 years and it's still just as good as the day I bought it. Um, you can handle, it can handle wet and moisture and frost and everything. And it, because of the wax uh, paper, it just wipes off clean and it's ready to go for next time. So um, the tower ad is the most common upgrade that most people would put on their scopes. Most telescopes are gonna come on its left side. It's called this easy finder. It's a little red dot. Um, it's a, a, good, a good finder, uh, helps line up your your eyepiece to what you're looking at for an object. A um, little bit harder to see because it's a small, uh, it's a relatively small spot that you're looking through. A lot of people will upgrade to a $40 Telrad. This is the one that's on the bottom left of the screen. This is about a, about a $40 item and it's got uh, con uh, uh, red concentric laser rings that you look through. And uh, it's really nice because you're looking right into the sky and it's got a half a degree, two degree and and uh, four degree uh, field of view, so with the rings. Uh, half a degree, for instance, would be the size of, of the moon. The full moon is about a half a degree wide, so it gives you that kind of uh, perspective. Really easy to look through. Um, there's a lot of different filters and other things that you can upgrade to, but honestly, most telescopes are probably gonna come with a moon filter. If you don't have one, you can buy one. Moon's pretty bright, so it's, uh, it's always nice to have a moon filter on it. You really don't need any other filters to start with. Uh, the moon filter is a really inexpensive thing. Um, typically, it's in that ten to twenty dollar range if you want. But it, hopefully, it'll be coming with your telescope. That's a common uh, addition that they'll that they add to a purchase of a telescope. So with that, before buying a telescope, you know, attend a star party if you can. We really encourage that with people that call and they, they're interested in buying a telescope. We invite them out to come to a star party. Why? Because you can look through many different types of telescopes and see uh, kind of what you want to look for. Are you interested in photography, interested in just viewing, you want something simple, do you want it uh, computerized, which may add a lot of complications and challenges that uh, I challenge you with. You, Want to make that decision uh, carefully so that you know exactly what you're getting and you have some support somewhere to help you understand how to use it. Um, hopefully this helps you a little bit about what to buy for a telescope. If you have any questions, please go to the prairieastronomyclub.org and uh, post any questions. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you for your time today. Have a great day.